Today, I want to talk about legacy, what we leave behind, the narratives we ascribe to our lives, our choices, to world events. In many ways, legacy represents a stop along the route from cold, empty facts to something like mythology. It represents meaning. If you do something to change the world, your Wikipedia page will have a whole section on legacy, on what defines your life, your work, how you will be remembered, even if that memory is clouded with half-truths and rumors. And it will be. If your impact upon the world is especially large and you're remembered for a very long time, the more time passes, the more myth and Mandela effect will distort and reshape your legacy. Our legacies are not our own. We can try to control them to guide the narrative, but ultimately the world decides what stories will define us and how we are remembered. In so many ways, legacy matters more than truth. Facts are only as valuable as their framing after all, and legacy is the framework with which we understand historic events and people. On April 20th, 1999, in Littleton, Colorado, two bullied goths took righteous vengeance on the popular kids that made their lives a living hell. They entered Columbine High School that morning, armed with AR-15s, and went on a jock hunting spree, targeting bullies, Christians, and the pretty girls who rejected their romantic advances. By the end of that school day, 15 people were dead. Except almost none of that was true on April 20th, 1999. But it remains the way the public remembers the Columbine Massacre. And this proliferation of mistruths, this sensationalized version of the tragedy, would become the genesis of Columbine's ultimate legacy, the era of the school shooter. Welcome back to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Hi, everyone. I'm Hoots. I'm Kellen. And I'm Mandy. And we had to break for the night after part one because it got a little bit intense. Um, so I just wanted to have like a little check in and like a little debrief because uh, <laughs> I know there were lots of thoughts on uh, the, the first episode in this this two parter. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> we came we finished recording part one and I was like, I can't do part two tonight like I couldn't I could barely even speak like (laughs) I I I was not in uh the mood to discuss anything I had just heard and if you are listening to this maybe you also understand that feeling um because as a not American who has like intentionally avoided knowing the like details Mm -hmm. about Columbine like I understood what happened I knew how many people died I think I know more about the myths that Mm -hmm. are false than I did ever hearing them to begin with um, because of a video that Hoots did (laughs) um, not too long ago, which I don't know if it exists anymore. Um, Definitely doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah. So I was, I was on the forefront of the, can we please do the second part on another day? I'm not sure how like anybody else was feeling but i appreciate (laughs) getting the chance to step away from it and have some time to actually like think about it and sleep on it right and i think uh i I don't know we had like a a bit of a conversation off of mike afterwards and i kind of wish we'd kept recording um because even though we're like you know we all live on the same land mass like mandy and i have had very different um i guess experiences and interactions with like the the world the public sphere because we live in a place where since 1999 like columbine is the thing that like created this um this pattern 
um, of like indiscriminate mass violence um, that has now become like such a mm-hmm. regular mm-hmm. part of our everyday life. Like I, I sent you guys a picture earlier today. I like went to Lens Crafters to pick up my glasses and there's like signs outside. They're like, please don't bring in your weapons. It's just not, it's a normal thing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And in Canada, that's not the case. There's, we don't have gun violence in that way at all. Like, it's very rare. Mm-hmm. If it does happen, it's usually like personal. Like, it's like one person shooting mm-hmm. another person. And it's, that's not, it's, that's not what you see. You see like people will occasionally right. get like stabbed or something, but like, the gun violence here is usually like Mm -hmm. gang or like Hmm. mafia related. Like it's like the people that the, all the mafia tow truck owners that own every tow truck in Ontario will like shoot each other. And like, that's about it. Yeah. Um, I know at the beginning of, of the part one, we sort of talked a little bit about our experiences Mm -hmm. hoots with like, um, how like we felt or what we remembered of Columbine, if we remembered it, uh, and all that. But, you know, one thing I, I thought of later um, that we didn't bring up, and I, I'd love to know what your guys' answer is to this, because I imagine I know the answer, what the answers are. But did you ever experience um, like active shooter drills in school? No, I think we did. Um, my my yeah. memory of school at this point is uh, I, I have lots of holes in my memory because I, I it was a long time ago. I'm very old. Uh, but I I believe we did. Um, and I. Yeah, I believe they were regular. I don't I don't know if they were as regular as they are now. Because, mm-hmm. um, again, it was a while ago. Um, but I remember I think they were bad, too. Like some of them were like, um, you know, the same kind of drills that we would do for like fire drills where you like go outside. Right. <laughs> We we had that we had fire drills. Um, I think in certain parts of Canada they do earthquake drills. Um, mm-hmm. But I just googled Canada shooter drill, and the first thing is basketball. <laughs> 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 yeah, that that shows. Uh, so there's a little is. difference there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely had uh, shooter drills in my schools. Um, the very mm-hmm. the first one that I can remember would have been in like sixth grade, so in middle school, is when we started doing them, and we would do them not like all the time, but like you did them like you know maybe twice a year, kind of a thing. Right. And it was always kind of weird because most of the time it was like, you know, we turn off the lights and we hide under our desks, or we all like line up against this one wall that would make it harder for them to look in and see us and be really mm-hmm. really quiet. But there was never like okay, but like what if we're in the hallway? What do we, like, there wasn't a lot of discussion about the other variables or um, escape plans necessarily. It was very much like, just, you know, be quiet in the dark and hope it's going to be okay. Yeah. And what was like, what was security like at your schools growing up? Because that is one thing that we did have. um, We had a lot of school resource officers. We had a lot of like our, um, we had a lot of security. We had a lot of cops in our schools. We we had very like gotcha. militarized um, schools. The only, we, we had one resource officer at the high school, like one guy. He, and he was like really friendly with most of the kids. He seemed nice enough. I mean, he was obviously he was mm-hmm. a cop. So like, you know, how nice he actually was, you know, we could have a whole discussion about that. But like it was a very chill vibe with it. Um, that, that was really the, the only thing that I had my entire like time in school. There wasn't, it was not militarized or anything like that. Just the, just the one guy who hung out around the school. Right. I I don't know if, I think I saw in a recent article about something to do with Gardner high, that there might have been a second person added, but I'm not sure about that. I went to seven different high schools and uh, well, six in person. So I went to six different high schools and there was no security or police in any of them. Um, in the ones in Toronto, there were um, cops frequently called to the school, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's there was no like mm. nobody was like stationed in the school, right? Yeah, right, like on staff, basically. Yeah, 
<sighs> yeah. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the aftermath um, and some of the myths around Columbine. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, students finished out the last 17 days of school um, of the school year at another school. Uh, Chatfield High School, a nearby school, actually um, volunteered and basically halved the rest of its school days so that they could accommodate the like 1600 something students from Columbine. Mm -hmm. So Chatfield kids would come to school for half the day and Columbine kids would come to school for half the day for the last okay. 17 days. They all should have gotten a hundred percent on all of their exams say. Yeah. <laughs> like, and like left to, to fuck off yeah. and like deal, yeah. not like fuck <laughs> off. That's a little harsh, but like to like just not be at fucking school. Yeah. Right. I don't know if that was an option for them. I, I imagine that maybe it was, I imagine that maybe there was a conversation where it's like, if you got to pull your kid out of school for the last 17 days, we won't count those as absences. Um, and maybe like there were kids that didn't and kids that did, but I do know that like, um, they went to Chatfield high school for like half days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they reported like, um, there, there's a, there's a documentary called We Are Columbine, because that was like, uh, weirdly, even before the attacks, their like unofficial slogan was We Are Columbine. They get together at pep rallies and uh, someone would shout, we are, and everyone would go Columbine. Uh -huh. And then that, yeah. you know, took on a kind of different meaning after yeah. the, the attacks. Um, so there's a documentary with that name. Um the interviews like a few of the people who were there um and most of them were actually class of 2002 so they were freshmen when the attacks happened um and the the class of 2002 has like a very um unique experience because their whole experience was just columbine in the aftermath you know yeah and then 9-11 uh, and yeah they experienced 9-11 from a distance um but they experienced like this incredible like ramping up of security there was like this yeah. um like right at the end of i think their last year uh they had planned this like unofficial food fight um mm -hmm. i think like the the juniors were meant mm -hmm. to like throw food at the senior like one of those silly little traditions that you do yeah um and the school officials were just like absolutely the fuck not because what could you be doing like what, what could you be hiding in food or whatever and kids were like getting into brawls with like school resource officers and stuff because these wow. kids were just like so pent up and frustrated and they yeah. they were grieving under a microscope they felt like they were being treated like criminals like at least the seniors at least the people who were like uh the shooter's age the shooter's class were gone after 17 days but the kids who had to stay there for another three years yeah. afterwards really really got a rough time yeah. really That's had a rough time of it um especially and with the media lurking around oh my god right trying yeah. to get stories get like mm -hmm. quotes and especially when you're young like i remember reading um about how they would like they would just send like young looking reporter i don't know if it was columbine but like post school shootings they would just send like young looking reporters in to just like walk into the school and talk, talk to, to people. people yeah they talked about you know like it, it was just constant like they would have like members of the media like taking them like to hotel rooms to interview them like every single day um and actually uh uh i'm skipping ahead a few bullets but on august 16th uh columbine actually uh was newly remodeled and it reopened for the the next school year for the 1999-2000 school year and 2000 kids showed up for class that day and they were shielded from the media by like just a long line of parents and teachers who stood outside and like blocked them. And oh. um, it, the media really became um, one of the villains of the tragedy. Like this mm -hmm. was a tragedy without any kind of closure. The mm -hmm. shooters died by suicide. Um they're so the like they're they're started to crop up all of these scapegoats um bullying became a scapegoat um the media yeah. became i mean the media rightly were were vultures uh in this case but they also kind of started to get scapegoated and like the town uh really kind of turned against the media um so this became like a whole 
whole thing. Um, just backing up a little bit, um, on June 1st, like after, I believe it was after or, or right at the end of the, uh, 1998, 1999 school year, um, students were permitted to return to school to collect all of their things that had just been left there. Just laying there, right? Like, Mm -hmm. just laying there where they drop them or in their Mm. lockers, all the things that had been there for, you know, over a month (laughs) about the media. There had like weirdly been a lot of media in the area at the time, like that the shooting was going on. Because the Jean Benet Ramsey case was like just down the oh. road. I did not know that. Uh, yeah, okay. and this was ninety nine. Jean Benet Ramsey was like I think two thousand uh, uh, nineteen ninety six. I want to say yeah, but you know it was co- like every couple of years we're talking about Jean Benet Ramsey. So like there was like lots of like international media in the area because like this because Denver is like a really <laughs> fucked up place, you guys. <laughs> there's so much fucked up shit that happens in denver suburbs um so yeah jamine ramsey <laughs> you're like and no thank you <laughs> gonna go cross that off of off of my list of places that i'm allowed to go <laughs> it's it's super fun cool city but the suburbs there are like cursed or something um so the fact that there were so many media outlets that were just like in the area uh meant that like dozens of news organizations Mm -hmm. were on the scene even while the shootings were still going on and again those happened in (sighs) under an hour like so it was like if you look at um like helicopter you know they were like listening to the like police radios and oh yeah just like waiting for something yeah Mm -hmm. and if you look at like the helicopter like news footage from the day um the school parking lot looks like a festival like there's just van after van after van yeah. like people setting up cameras everywhere um like while these kids are still running out of the building and kids who'd who'd escaped columbine that day and like had run to neighboring houses like i like i said in the first part yeah. um because there was all this like media coverage they literally just like sat in strangers living rooms and watched, and watched yeah. their friends either escaping or not escaping did anybody go in that wasn't an official first responder that you know of? Like, do you know if any, like, parents tried to go in or, like, like while it was um, happening? I don't think I don't think any parents tried to okay. go in. I think there was, like, actually a pretty decent blockade. Okay. Um, and, again, um, w- I mean, we'll, we'll talk about, like, the changes that have happened in schools in the years since. Um, this is a little bit of a looser and dirtier episode. Yeah. Um, but, like, there was also not – because this was, like, the first um, – active shooter uh Mm -hmm. situation like that was like this um they were treating it like a hostage situation like they were blockading and waiting outside and waiting for demands like what do you want people inside the school have guns and yeah yeah oh boy that's so fucked up so i didn't really mm -hmm. i didn't think about that i didn't understand that like because nowadays somebody in the school has a gun you know mm-hmm. they're there yes. to kill kids. Prior to that, yeah. right? They're like it would be like a bank mm-hmm. robbery. Like, right. there's something that they're using they them want. as leverage. Yeah. Not. Okay. Oh no, they're just yeah. literally just indiscriminately yeah. killing people. And they they had known yeah. obviously okay. that some people had died because like the first couple of kids died on the mm-hmm. outside, um, but right. they just they had never seen anything like this before and obviously parents had never heard of anything like this before. So you don't have something like we had with Uvalde where they were having to like tackle parents to not yeah. have them. Cause like yeah. the parents also probably would have assumed like there's, there's some kind of a shooting. My kid probably is in fact, not probably definitely. I know Daniel Mauser's father has said that like uh, he heard about the shooting from um, one of his coworkers and his coworker was like, doesn't your kid go there? And he was like, yeah, but Daniel won't be involved in whatever, whatever is going on between those kids. Cause he's a good kid. <sighs> he just assumed it was like gang related or something yeah. as shootings were before oh that. Um, so he was like, he was like, I, he talks about it now and he's like, I, I wasn't even worried at the time. Um, so sadly, the fact that there was so much media 
just on the scene as like while it was still happening meant two things. Uh, the first was that the kids began to process, you know, mm-hmm. began yeah. like a grieving process in a, in a fishbowl. Um, the media like was just constantly on them. And, and how do you start to, uh, how do you start to process like what you just went through when you're constantly being asked questions constantly being asked are you th- were you there even like the kids that are like in their 40s now say that they still hate they're like the second I tell people where I'm from and what mm-hmm. school I went to yeah. they say oh my god were you there and yeah. they they said they still dread hearing that yeah of course like well because it's because they've spent 20 years trying ha- having to explain over and over right. again yeah. what having to, to re- relive the trauma over and over again for someone else's like curiosity or entertainment it's such an ugly yeah. fucking mm-hmm. thing to ask somebody to right like what the fuck i think i would just say i'm Were sorry you <laughs> like, like you know so many bitches got decked it. at some point like no right, like they'll leave, tell you if they want to tell you yeah. like right. if people want to tell you something they'll tell you something like right. trying to get like a little story out of it yeah. is just like I'll... I mean I know that it's common a lot of people would yeah. do that of course it's like because like people yeah. are curious and they don't understand yeah. how like trauma yeah. works but and I guess fuck. there's like a part of you that wants to be like were you there are you mm-hmm. okay like obviously you're alive but like um also I just think it'd be funny if like somebody told you that they went to Columbine High School and you'd be like, "What's that? I've never heard of it." <laughs> <laughs> they probably would be. Very oh my god, who she? <laughs> yeah, stick to the bit, you know. Um, but like the the media became like so vilified by the community, um, and kids like started even going to get like specially screen printed shirts that said "I don't want to talk," and they were wearing them oh, to wow. school. <laughs> in front okay, of the, yeah it is pretty based i kind of want talk. one <laughs> <we're> to work. <laughs> um the second <laughs> unfortunate thing about the media being there on the scene as it was happening uh was that kids were running out of the school and being asked questions by journalists while they were running out of the school and the media began uncritically reporting <sighs> some of the inf- misinformation that was coming out of the school while it was still an active shooter event. Oh <laughs> Fucking just like sticking cameras fa- in the faces of these kids who are like crying and have just like run out. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. what's happening? Who's Which doing is ex- it? <laughs> exactly what they asked. They asked, do you know the shooters? Who's doing it? Uh, of course. So the first myth to come out of this was that the shooters were part of the trench coat mafia. Is that even real? Yes, okay. there was a group of kids at Columbine that called themselves the Trenchcoat Mafia, like in the same way that we call ourselves the Wishes of Stitcher. <laughs> right. Like, uh, yeah. I'm like, are we even were... on Stitcher? <laughs> <laughs> literally. <laughs> they were literally just like, they were silly little goth kids. And I think they started wearing trench coats for like a period of like a week for, for like a bit. And then the bit stuck because that's what happens when you're 15 or you know, 35 and have a podcast. <laughs> and uh, the shooters were not uh, were not members of the trench coat mafia. They, they may have been casual friends with a couple of them, um, but they were not close and they were not considered to be like part of that clique. It was it was just like theatery goth kids. They were just also wearing long coats. Yes. Uh, so where that misinformation seems to have stemmed from is the fact that witnesses on the day of the attack saw the shooters wearing the dusters, which look like trench coats, and just assumed. What's the difference? Do you know? Um, I think it's the shape. Okay. I think trench coats are a little bit more like uh, Max, like a little bit more like uh, 1940s. Right. And, and yes. dusters are like what we think of when we Cowboy. think of school shooters. Yeah. They're like the, the boxier. They're cut. open. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So... Uh, yeah. So the, the kids who were like literally running out of the building just quickly saw these kids wearing what looked like black trench coats and thought, oh, it's those kids who wear trench coats. Um, but in fact, this, the shooters were only wearing the dusters to conceal their weaponry that they were wearing into school. And both of them abandoned them like pretty soon after they started shooting. Um, the video. They didn't even commit to the bit. No, cause they weren't like, they, I mean, 
Dusters, they weren't trying to like look cool. No. Like this wasn't like some like cool. Matrix shit. <laughs> Dusters do look cool, but like that was not why they were wearing them. Like yeah. they were wearing them to conceal their weapons. And like, right? Uh, what was it? Eric in particular, um, I believe he was wearing a t-shirt, a custom made t-shirt that he had underneath uh, that said natural selection. So, you know, he wanted people to see that. He didn't want people to see his fucking trench coat. Right. Oh, God. Yeah. He's so fucking cringe. He's so cringe. I'm like, is it natural selection? Because you fucking died here, you yeah. loser. I mean, I know like, all 18 year olds are cringe, but this is like yeah. really cringe. Like, all everyone is cringe, yeah. but like not like murderously so. Yeah. <laughs> the worst kind of cringe. Homicidally yes. cringe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was also the rumor, uh, again, from just people talking out of their fucking ass and assuming that they were people that they weren't, um, that the shooters were, I don't want to say talking out of their ass because these were traumatized children, uh, yeah. but like children who were speaking with authority on uh, something that they only quickly witnessed something they thought they witnessed um yeah so there was a rumor that during a traumatic during a event, traumatic event when like tons of shit is going on mm-hmm. people are running and screaming yeah, they're yeah. like adrenaline's out a thousand no they should say whatever the fuck they want yeah. nobody should have been fucking reporting yeah it. they could say it was like, fucking <laughs> mickey mouse or something like yeah. and and <laughs> right. the media would uncritically <laughs> report so that. scary <laughs> Oh my god! I just like, invented a new creepy pasta. Not not Mickey Mouse wearing a natural selection T shirt. <laughs> Mickey Mouse school shooter. So fucking terrifying. Oh no! Oh. Of all the no, thank you. Of all the respect the dead episodes to get fan art. No. <laughs> There's gonna be some sick little nasty girls on Tumblr drawing this up right now. And to you, I say, stop <sighs> it. Release us. Mm-mm. I'm so glad you mentioned Tumblr because I'm also going to mention that in a little bit. Uh, (laughs) There was uh, so there was also a rumor at the time uh, that the shooters were bullied and frequently Mm. called the F slur. Faggot for everyone listening. (laughs) I can say it. it. (laughs) I can say it. it. (laughs) I can say it. Don't worry. Oh God, Kaylin, are you gay? (laughs) Sometimes it depends if it if I can use it to annoy someone. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god being gay for the bit is so funny <laughs> so this rumor may have also come from people mistaking them for members of the trench coat mafia who were like definitely outsiders again they were like silly little goth kids uh and i i wouldn't which is very gay which is very gay i was about to say i wouldn't i wouldn't be yeah. surprised if a couple of them were queer so dave cullen who wrote columbine uh posits that the shooters weren't bullied at all but were actual bullies themselves he makes the argument that they were actually pretty popular because they both went to prom three days before the attack and they both had dates i think the reality of the situation was probably a little of column a a little of column b i was say having a date to prom isn't what makes you popular yeah, like, i was about to say like yeah that's <laughs> that's not yeah yeah they were not outcasts no like that's not popular that means someone agreed a single person agreed to go with you yeah they were not outcasts like they did have friends but they they also had like people who were shitty to them like one of the videotapes that the shooters like is all high school yeah it's all high school um (laughs) one of the videotapes that the shooters made uh that is that has been released to the public shows one of them like getting pushed into a locker like pretty violently and he's and calling him the F slur and he just sort of shakes it off and keeps walking like it's a thing that normally happens. Um, so, yeah, he probably got. But, but that was not like the uh, that was not the reason for the attack. Yeah. Um, it seems like they were very much middle of the pack people and they uh, mm-hmm. they also yeah. did a fair amount of bullying, uh, including a bunch of the students up in the library before they. Yeah before they killed them also like that's just uh like that usage for like a motive like being bullied it's like i can guarantee you i was called the f slur a lot more than they were and like my response is to be like wow violence is really bad (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't like it. Your response was to be like, wow, maybe I am. <laughs> well, okay, that was first. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't considered that. <laughs> I'm going to go downstairs <laughs> and look it up it in out. my Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> and ooh, that does sound good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the whole bullying narrative started like a, a national conversation around bullying in high schools and really made the public and American school systems start to take it seriously for the first time. Like, I don't want to call this a silver lining because I also think it's like an overblown part of the conversation, mm-hmm. but it was like the first time that America started to take bullying seriously yeah. because everyone was terrified of another Columbine. Yeah. Like not for the right reasons. It wasn't like we should make sure that our children feel uh happy it, yeah it was like we should make sure that these <laughs> the, psycho nerds don't pull this yeah pull we this need to stop in. bullying them because they're evil not like because yeah. we're evil <laughs> right. and we um, need to that stop play that i mentioned to the two of you in the first part the shoot shoot, 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 shoot. <laughs> yeah bang bang whatever the fuck it was called um after the play we had to do this thing where we all like sat on the stage and opened it up as like a q a and one of the things that was talked about was like well what can we do to make sure nothing like this ever happens in our oh day-to-day God. lives and the <laughs> advice was just like well you know um be nice to people and befriend people and if you see someone sitting alone at a table in the cafeteria go say hi to them no he might be a killer that that they're cared for you know things like that and it was just like i remember the whole like they were supposedly bullied being a big part of the conversation Mm -hmm. like i believe that for the longest time because everyone said it all the time not the little jam sesh at the end where you all sit in your backwards (laughs) chair and being like who else has been called a faggot here you look like you've been called a faggot we were what 17 years old talking to other like 16 year olds oh my god what advice do we fucking have and i mean like this is like a really toxic narrative to come out of this because uh like first of all like it's it's really victim blaming it Um, is and and secondly, um, it kind of it really played into the uh, aggrievement and like the sense of entitlement of like the mass killers who would go on to be inspired by this. Mm-hmm. Um, this is why like we have uh, like why so many of them are like incels. Yeah. Why so because so many of them are like yeah bitch you should have been nicer to me you should have let me put my penis yeah. inside of you and now because you didn't i'm i'm gonna go call him by right. your ass like this was your responsibility to stop this. right and there's like weirdly like these public conversations happening sometimes where people are like well what if we like ha- like we should um legalize sex work so that then these young men can have these sex workers instead and it's like you understand it wouldn't be safe for the sex worker, right? Like, why are you saying that we that they are owed this or that we that should be the eventual goal? Like, no, it shouldn't fucking be the goal. Like, that's not going to fix anything. And also, sex workers still deserve their own autonomy. They deserve to pick their clients and they shouldn't have to have a client like that who, you know, has these usually very misogynistic ideas about them. You know, yeah, so like, these kind of people, these kind of people aren't going to go to sex workers because actually sex workers are available in a lot of their areas. Right. They feel entitled to <laughs> the women that they feel entitled right. to. Yeah. They usually fixate on yeah. one or two. Yeah. And like in, in many of these cases, like the the women that they feel sexually entitled to are not the only uh, people or women in their lives that they feel entitled to. Very often these people will like kill their mothers yeah. or their grandmothers and misogyny is not relegated to like one type of woman mm-hmm. like one yes. demographic like it is ingrained yep. if you do not see mm-hmm. women as like your at least equal which for these guys they might want to like amp that up a little bit <laughs> to be mm-hmm. like a better <laughs> um but the like i'm killing people as like a a form of retaliation and revenge for all the Mm -hmm. wrongs that have been done to me um is very like i'm the underdog i'm fighting back against depression except for like this is always like straight cis white dudes like they're Mm -hmm. never actually the underdog they just if even if they were being bullied it would just be like well i'm supposed to be the bully and i'm not Mm -hmm. I don't, yes. I'm not, I'm not getting that 
um, that like privilege and that place in the hierarchy that <laughs> I'm entitled to by right of my mm-hmm. birth and my tiny thin little lips. <laughs> no, it's it's so true. And and I will say misogyny is one of the through lines of all of these like mass oh, yeah. mass killers. Um a lot a lot of killers in general. Serial killers loved themselves some misogyny. The I think the only real school shooting in Canada was a guy who went um and uh shot up a school that was like all like a women's technical institute Mm -hmm. and like you also had like that that. you had that incel that drove a truck into a crowd yes yes which i i'll loop other mass killings in who was apprehended like very very chill by the police they just like funny how that happens Mm -hmm. uh yeah i i kind of loop in like the odd uh, driving a truck into a crowd, crowd um, and you know, um, mm-hmm. bombing a marathon in with uh, with shootings because the the goal is indiscriminate mass killing, not targeted, um, no. yeah, and yeah. not serial killing, which might be indiscriminate but happens, you know, in little little trickles, in courses, <laughs> in little little phases. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my killing the specific person era. <laughs> it's like the people who keep cycling in and out of veganism. <laughs> <laughs> just a little more it's killing like just, and I'll stop. <laughs> I've just been so good this week. <laughs> Let me just kill this one guy. He looks really <laughs> shitty and he probably is cheating on his wife and looks a little racist so like what if i just just one more just one more i promise i promise diet starts monday <laughs> columbine also seemed to be the genesis of the national conversation around violent video games um, so yep. the killers were very fond of a game called doom Ever heard of it? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I love the Doom series. Not, oh my god! Yes. Oh my god! Not not Doom is grooming our children. Dooming our Doom. children. Doomers. <laughs> Stay away from our kids, Doomers. <laughs> <laughs> Nor. Uh, uh, so the killers are very fond of Doom. Doom and um, And we're also obsessed with violent movies and kill counts. So. The whole this whole inquest was started into whether or not violent media played a part in the massacre, and we'd continue. Okay, so wait. Hold on. So it's the kids who got shots' fault. Yes, and, and video, video games. games and and violent movies. movies. Fault. Like okay, I okay. mean, we we talked a little bit in the first episode about how much like how eerily they represent like this they uh, resemble the scream killers the scream. in the yeah. in first in the first mm-hmm. scream. They were yeah. obsessed with movies. Um, they were obsessed with performance. They mm-hmm. were obsessed with, um, with uh, yes. like making like a grand statement and shocking images. Um, so I like in a uh, very abstract sense. Sure, uh, did Doom cause them to go kill a bunch <laughs> of kids? No, they called their plan NBK after Natural Born Killers. Natural Born Killers is a very violent movie, but it's, it's not, not like, this. like did did it cause them to have? Yeah, they also they were also obsessed with the Basketball Diaries starring Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio. <laughs> okay, could they not have done that <laughs> instead? That at least does have a how random? <laughs> well, that's where he like is a drug addict. Oh, okay. It's it's a it's a very melodramatic movie. There is like a dream <laughs> sequence in it where he's like wearing a black duster and he charges into a school and he shoots people. Um, but it's it's a very silly slow motion dream sequence. These boys had terrible is, taste, I have to say. Is the Basketball Diaries the like boy version of Virgin Suicides, where like it seemed deep when you were yes. like ten yes. years old? <laughs> I'm gonna say Natural okay. Born Killers is the same too. It's yeah. like yeah, it it's uh, Oliver Stone, but it's like a scream. It's based on a screenplay written by, like, a developed from a screenplay written by Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. So it's like distilled from gotcha. Tarantino, 
and it's definitely early Tarantino. Like there, it's it. Some of it seems yeah, a bit and shallow. Like, jumping back, like yeah. to what you said, it's like. I've watched plenty of movies. I, I love movies. I love TV shows. I love there are certain movies I can watch over and over again. Certain mm-hmm. TV shows I can watch all the time. There's certain things about certain movies I love to pick apart in terms mm-hmm. of like cinematography and performances and greater themes and how they're tying into everything. And I have not gone on any mass shootings. And I've enjoyed, I've also enjoyed violent video games. And you know, like I, I, I love so some of these movies. conversations. I do get a little annoyed because it's like I know plenty of people who Same. partake in these things and they're not violent people. Like that can be just an outlet for people. So saying that that's inspiring, yeah. it's like maybe on some kind of maybe level, but like uh, I don't know. <laughs> maybe the like aesthetics of it or like the how they carry out the plan but like people that are going to do that are going to do that because Mm -hmm. and like (laughs) maybe they'll do it in a way that's more like reminiscent of something they've already heard about but like it sounds like the media reporting on um like previous like mass death is more responsible than oh, like yeah. <laughs> the media the that's that like most... was it video games and it was like okay <laughs> little miss point that finger back at yourself yeah the thing that they were like, most inspired by was timothy mcveigh which i'm sure right. was like, like an actual real life was, person yeah yeah like the the way that they discuss <laughs> because of it the, media. the way that they put his name everywhere yeah yeah sensationalized it yeah i've seen yeah. his face everywhere yeah 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 that was it like Yes, they were they were silly little AV boys who like filmed themselves walking around in black dusters trying to yeah. look cool, but that wasn't what made them killers. There's, mm-hmm. you know, it, there's a million of those today. And they're they're normally just like normal little nerds who who go to full yeah. sale and just get saddled with $100,000 in debt. Like a like, normal person. <laughs> this is <laughs> So have you guys ever okay i think you have because i think um this question came up from one of you um in the first part you've you've heard of the whole like she said yes story with cassie bernal yes okay caitlin have you Mm, no okay here we go everything about this story is an all-around bummer like this is this is just sad um so cassie bernal was one of the girls killed in the library um she was a born again Christian. Um, she had like really struggled with <sighs> drug and alcohol abuse um, and and suicidal ideation okay. earlier in her teens. So this, I asked about this. I did not know it had anything to do with her. I'm basing all my knowledge on a TikTok trend that was going around where people reenacted being shot because they um, refused to deny, uh, refused to denounce Christ. So it was oh really it was like 14 to like 17 year old those. like white They're christian disgusting. girls on TikTok like recreating yep. being shot because they refused to denounce Christ and it was a huge trend that was going on and that was my first um okay that was my like entry into this and that was like last year yeah okay I did not know that this came from Columbine and that's why when you brought that up I was like wait Okay. Okay. This is this is even weirder okay. and more upsetting. Oh, good. Um, yeah. So, like I said, uh, she she was a born again Christian. Um, she in her earlier teens, she like really struggled with drug and alcohol abuse and suicidal ideation. She like had a lot of like she would like threaten to kill her parents. Um, she wrote like very violent journal en- entries that were like similar to the violent journal entries that the two killers wrote. Like she was really really struggling um and then she basically like turned around her entire life um about a year and a half before her death um because she went to a christian summer retreat um you know i i think there's a lot that's toxic about the born again movement but like she seems to have really been a troubled teen who like i guess found some kind of like validation or purpose or meaning in her faith um and uh really like started to like settle down a little bit more and like um become a happier person um because of this so i can't really knock that um 
Cassie was the one who was shot point blank by one of the killers who said peekaboo. Like he looked under the desk, said peekaboo, shot her and killed her. Um, And one of the survivors had had an exchange with one of the killers who asked her if she believed in God. And when she was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, she said yes. And then um, and he was like, why? And she was like, I guess because my parents believe it. And then uh, he was like, well, we're all going to die anyway. She lived. Um, She had been shot, but she uh, he didn't kill her. Right. He got distracted because. Yes. Because of his friend. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somehow in the reports that immediately followed Columbine, some wires got crossed um, and Cassie's Mm -hmm. parents believed that she was the one who asked if she believed in God and she responded yes and she was shot and killed. And this becomes like a huge moment for evangelicals and for her grieving parents. So her parents um, publish a book about her life story um, called like, she says yes. And, and like they, they, you know, (laughs) it, parts of it feel gross, but then parts of it are like, these are grieving parents. And like, this is the one thing that they can latch on to so that they can be like, well, she didn't die for, for nothing. Like she, she died for a reason. Um, There are like pushes in the wider evangelical movement to like, canonize her as a protestant saint there's like only five protestant saints one of them is martin luther king jr like there are pushes to like canonize cassie bernal like she becomes this massive story of hope for people and all the while the witness who was under the table with cassie was like no that's not what happened and val schner is like no i was the one who said i believe in god but Val was alive and not dead. And that made her like less sympathetic to like this survivor was kind of like low key getting like dragged through the mud for like trying to oh, deny. They're like, oh, you're like stealing her like, valor. Stolen yeah. valor. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Um, it, investigators also knew that Cassie Bernal didn't say that like immediately because there's security footage and audio of everything that happened in the library. It's right, just never been released yeah, to the public. phone. Right. Yep, the phone was on. There was uh, they couldn't hear and everything the over. Were listening. Yeah, they couldn't hear everything over nine one one, but they could hear a lot of it. But there was also security footage with audio of like every public area in the school, like like there is today, um, and especially in libraries because they want to make sure that kids aren't stealing books or making um, out so, or making out with the books. Uh, <laughs> the books. Mm, paper cuts <laughs> <laughs> on my tongue. So yeah, there there is footage and audio of every single thing that went down in the library, which is why we have such an exact timeline of what went down. Um, it just hasn't mm-hmm. been released to the public because that's fucking yeah. sick. So like, it's oh god, it's it's like one of these myths that still like, um, that still uh, is is how do I, how I, I'm looking for the wrong words um it's one of these myths that still persists about columbine is this whole like she said yes thing um it's one of the first things that you think uh, it's it's like the columbine version of like and the band played on except the band actually did play on we have several eyewitness eyewitness accounts to that yeah. cassie bernal did not say yes <laughs> somebody else did <laughs> right that can actually verify but, that. like uh, yeah right they still asked someone and they very easily could have killed her like mm-hmm. but the the narrative is that she was killed because because she was a christian she said yes yeah but like nobody else was asked yeah like like they were they were looking for something like right. if she had had glasses they would have called her four eyes yep. they were just like looking for something right yeah to say to each person they only asked to make that their girl. last moments yeah yeah. They only asked Val Schnorr yeah. because she kept saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he was like, huh, you believe in God? Like, it was not a, <laughs> do you believe in God? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, and that's exactly the way it's described was described to me. And um, like that was brought up in my church because I, I grew up Northern Baptist. So I used to go to church. And I remember that be- coming up like in service talking about uh. like this brave young woman who stoically looked in the face of a, a guy with a gun in her you know in her face and yeah. was like 
unwavering said yes to the lord and and died for it you know don't you want to be a <sighs> martyr for the lord and i was like i don't i had no um, <laughs> idea they were still making like tiktoks based on this that's crazy yeah that's why yeah I, i've seen them they're just so gross and uh, like this story in particular is one that like i think circles back to my kind of intro um and and my like moral dilemma in looking at the legacy uh, not moral dilemma but like does the fact that cassie bernal didn't actually say yes matter or does what matter is 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 what matters the uh the legacy of the myth is what matters that people believe that she did yeah, I think the, that's a hard question. I think the truth always matters mm -hmm. because that's taking away someone else's story yeah. as well. And I think I think that's the part that would bother me if people were just making shit up about something that never happened to anyone. But it happened to another girl. Uh, like other than the fact that that Christians are using it to further their um yeah, like that's... Christian supremacist uh uh talking point where they are the attacked ones mm -hmm. which usually leads to like anti-semitism mm -hmm. um that to me is like where it gets like politically dangerous but like from like an ethical standpoint somebody else like imagine hearing that story being told when it actually happened yeah. to you like that is i mean up. like the the christian persecution complex about it i think I think is an argument for why like it doesn't matter that it didn't happen because the, they ran yeah. with the story anyway. And now it is such a part of our culture that it's like more real to people than what really happened. When people think of Columbine, this yeah. is one of the stories they think of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did not realize when I was watching that because I saw the TikToks. The reason they were on my For You page is because people were fucking clowning on them mm -hmm. because it is it is a ridiculous thing. Like they were literally it was like one audio um, and then there was like a, a gunshot sound at the end of it. And like, these are like, f like 17 or 18 year olds, like slumped down oh on my the floor God. in their room pretending they were just shot for God. Yeah. And there was like, like there's like a couple of variations on it too. Like there were ones where it was like a woman, women pretending to have been beaten up. So they're like covered in bruises and have like fake blood. Mm -hmm. Like they have a bloody yeah. lip. Uh, mm -hmm. who then die in some manner. Usually they get shot, but sometimes it's something else. Um, and then they're like in heaven and 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 they have like a voice coming from a hun high about how proud they are. <laughs> and it's it's Christian gross. TikTok is is bonkers. Yeah. I will find these and I will send Please them to do. you later if you want to see. I will include them, them in the show notes yeah. for this episode. Um okay. I the okay, only yeah. one I've seen is the one where where the woman gets like beat up for saying that she won't take the jab and then she goes to heaven. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Those are awesome. good. That's a banger. In the same genre. <laughs> that is an absolute banger. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, I've cited Dave Collins' book, Columbine, several times in this two-parter episode. Uh, it is considered the definitive work. It is a masterpiece. It is an incredibly harrowing work of nonfiction. He literally spent 10 years researching and writing it, like interviewing, oh, like no. living in Littleton and interviewing people. Um, it is wonderful. I highly recommend it. However... One of the narratives that it pushes um, that has been the subject of some criticism and reexamination is this narrative that actually seems to have come from the criminal psychologists who investigated the case. Uh, so analyzing the killer's journals, psychologists determined that Eric uh -oh. Harris was a classic psychopath who mostly wanted to kill people. And Dylan Klebold was a schizotypal depressive who mostly wanted to kill himself. And that these two entered into a sort of fully a do together. And that Eric Harris was really the mastermind of the whole thing. This is uh, kind of based on the fact that in, in the journals that we have and the, the notes that we have, Dylan wrote more about love and Eric wrote more about hate 
uh, like Dylan had <laughs> Dylan. This is cringe too, but in a cute way, Dylan had whole pages of his journal just like covered in drawings of hearts, <laughs> and like he wrote about crushes that he had a lot. Okay, that's kind of cute. Um, I'll admit. <laughs> yeah. But he also had a lot of violence yeah. in there um, and vice versa. You know, Eric also had like some normal like stuff about girls that he liked and stuff. Um, I personally think it's kind of shocking that criminal psychologists would actually diagnose two people they'd never met off of some writing they'd left behind that can only represent like part of their internal mm -hmm. lives. And in general, the term psychopath is a very controversial yeah. one. I mean, I'm not surprised that criminal psychologists would do that. I do not think that that is a way that you can get an accurate diagnosis. But like, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. these people must have been clamoring to get their name slapped on this shit. Yeah. Because like oh, yeah. the infamy that comes with that, like these, these two men or these two boys, um, were seeking infamy by doing this but a lot mm -hmm. of other people like f oh yeah the investigators found their on the own camp. from them and the more like just like in the media like the more salacious the story is the more you can sensationalize mm -hmm. it the more um whoever's willing to be uh, like adamant and concrete and being like I have a diagnosis for each of them that you can run with versus the kind of person who's like well I don't think it would be a good idea to like try and diagnose someone off of a notebook like only one of them is going to get the airtime and the credit for right. it so in an article for psychology today titled psychopaths the worst people who don't exist <laughs> that's a banger title <laughs> <laughs> it, it fucking rocks. Uh, <laughs> Gabriel C.S. Gavin writes, despite being in common usage for years, the psychiatrist's Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, does not include psychopathy as a diagnosis. The World Health Organization, the American Psychiatric Association, and countless other professional bodies have also chosen to avoid the term. Instead of the very real risk of branding people suffering from an often tormenting mental health condition with an emotionally loaded stigmata, they tend to use diagnoses like antisocial personality disorder. Far from being a useful description, psychopath conjures up the perfect image of someone you wouldn't be desperate to help, someone as inhuman as those previously branded evil. Psychopathy as a concept is therefore rather dangerous. It seduces us into the belief that People who do really terrible things do so for motivations we would never be capable of sustaining. Mm -hmm. It puts us beyond the pale of ever being able to do the same and reduces the scrutiny that we apply to our own actions. It prevents us from always bearing in mind that there is indeed evil in the world, but the people who commit it are just like you and me. Um, so the, like, the branding of him as a psychopath... I think the, the like, yeah, the branding of him is like this masterminded, like the psychopath mastermind um, is troubling, first of all, because like psychopath is like one of those terms like narcissist where we can just kind of like use it to like write off people with personality disorders, people who've experienced um, a, abuse or trauma, mm. like, um, and that like can very quickly become like, a, like a, an eliminationist kind of rhetoric, <laughs> like psychopaths can't be helped. Yeah. They can only be destroyed. Yeah. Well, there's also, there's, there's that, like, there's nothing we can do to prevent mm -hmm. it either. Because these are just fundamentally mm -hmm. damaged people that can't be part of society, as opposed to like, maybe there's something going on in society that is fundamentally damaging mm -hmm. these people. <laughs> like Dave Cullen <laughs> even goes as, goes so far as to suggest that if Eric Harris hadn't done Columbine, he would have committed some other, maybe more terrible string of murders or mass <laughs> acts of violence. And I think that this is a bit of a cope. Who the like, fuck are you? Little Miss yeah. Nostradamus, you got <laughs> something to say? Oh yeah, he totally would have done something worse. And I'm like, okay, so he now done nine eleven times ten. <laughs> Welcome to nine twelve. <laughs> <laughs> 
like maybe Fuck he would have done something else bad or or worse and maybe he would have just like grown up to be a completely normal adult and everyone would have been would have lived and been fine like yeah like maybe he would have been a youtuber so not a perfectly normal adult <laughs> Right. Maybe he would have gone on to regret yeah. what he did, maybe, or I don't know. Like, you, you don't, you have no idea. Maybe he would have just been a trash man for the rest of his life. We literally have no idea. Yeah. I can make up anything about maybe him. Maybe he just would have beat his wife right. like every other shitty white guy. Maybe like, he would have gone on to be a cop. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Honestly, like the predestination yeah. of mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. like, um, it absolves everyone mm-hmm. of any accountability include like all the way up to the patriarchy like yeah well and that's the argument that's always made against any kind of reasonable gun control as well as like people who want to kill will find a way to kill which is like not true Mm -hmm. (laughs) like people in canada can't really go on killing sprees because Mm -hmm. like if you try and charge at a bunch of people with a fucking knife like someone's gonna clobber you in the head. It's really hard to kill someone with a knife, too. You really have to have yeah, people get like stabbed like eighty times, and they're like <laughs> just like brought to the hospital, yeah. stitched up, and it's like, yeah, well, things aren't gonna be great for a while, but <laughs> like dr- all of those eighty stabs were on one person, yeah. not that's a crowd why, of people. That's why so many like killers in horror movies use knives because it's way more interesting to watch someone like who might be able to escape with 40 yeah. or 50 stab wounds than like <laughs> yeah. if you shoot them the movie's over. <laughs> <laughs> like I this whole thing I think is like a fucking cope like uh because I think the idea that maybe like it maybe he would have outgrown his like weird homicidal uh you know hormonal phase and become a normal person is so much mm-hmm. more terrifying right and that like horror could have been yeah. easily averted or prevented if literally anything happened that morning to stop them like if they yeah. had been caught if they had uh if if they had run into somebody who made them not want to do it like not not even convince them not to do it but like maybe the girl that they ran into at 7 30 in the morning maybe they they saw her and they're like i don't feel like doing this anymore do you want to like or one of them got cold feet like literally literally anything could have could have stopped this and like maybe they'd just be like perfectly normal adults and there would be 15 people alive Mm -hmm. today and their children that wouldn't have otherwise been alive. Um, I also think this theory that um, Eric was a psychopath and that Dylan was a depressive who just like went along with him uh, lets Dylan off the hook for his roles in the killing. Yeah, it does. None of them sounded like they were just going along. No. They were having fun. And isn't Dylan the one you said whose mother has been very yes. like forthcoming and, and talks to me a lot? So do you think that's part yeah. of it? Is like because she's so sympathetic, it's made that him is more sympathetic. Absolutely, my very next okay. bullet in my script. <laughs> like I said, no, like you are going exactly where I was leading you. Like yeah, uh, this I did. is this is a hoots personal theory. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I haven't seen this written anywhere. So uh, just like a an FYI to our audience, like this is a thoughts of a dumb bitch but um i um great podcast yes. name, by the <laughs> way. i personally think sue klebold's willingness to talk about her experiences has made people feel closer and more sympathetic toward dylan and i think that there is this deep desire to prove that a mostly normal depressed kid who like had crushes and liked movies and resembles a lot of the teens that we knew growing up or that we were growing up. Uh, Like, I think that there's this Mm -hmm. desire to like prove that he wasn't responsible um, or as responsible. Uh, And he, he was like Sue Klebold said uh, in the first months following the shooting Even she was in denial about her son's responsibility in the killings. But when she saw the basement tapes that weren't released to the public and like her son talking about what he planned to do, um, she recognized that he was just as responsible as the other kid and that he wasn't like he was he was also an active and enthusiastic participant in the murders. Enthusiastic is the is the key is the key part there yeah um and i like i 
I feel a lot for Sue Klebold and I think like what she has done like uh, talking about her experiences is like um, incredibly brave because like oh boy the idea of like mourning your son and then also like dealing with the guilt and shame yeah. of like what he did um, that like what the parents of the victims went through is impossible to understand this is even more impossible to understand this is like completely alien um and i think it's it's like very brave of her to talk about that and to talk about like mourning your child and also coming to terms with the fact that your child like ruined your yeah. like ruined the world for a lot of people yeah um is i think that's amazing um she must got a lot of fucking hate. i'm sure the the letters that would oh, be yeah. showing up mm -hmm. in her mailbox like mm -hmm. i know this is like sort of pre mm -hmm. like she obviously existed in like doing this work into the internet era but like um mm -hmm. it must have been v she didn't talk publicly about it for 10 years okay. but then she's she's been like very vocal about it since so she spent those two okay. 10 years like processing and like grieving and then she was like I have to talk about what it's like to be the mother of a mass shooter in the era yeah, of a mass shooting. Those 10 years, uh, I forgot. I, I know you mentioned that um, in part one, but I kind of forgot about that. Um, that makes it a little less uh, weird to me. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, is she, yeah, I'm so like, she is she, is she like, like, we'll like hi, up. Oprah, thank you for having me. <laughs> I have to imagine that, like, the fact that Columbine became a phenomenon and not just like one tragedy probably influenced her decision yeah. to come yeah. forward after 10 years and talk about it. Because like now she, it's not just their families. It's like mm -hmm. dozens mm -hmm. of families of killers. I do also want to say that like the Harris family, um, just as valid a decision, but like they've done the opposite. Like they have completely... Mm -hmm shut off they've like um they they haven't spoken to the media at all um i think that is a total yes, agreed, a yeah. totally valid choice to make um but as a result i my personal theory is that people are less inclined to sympathize with mm -hmm. their son than the other killer because mm -hmm. they haven't and been likely with them as well like there is mm -hmm. Anytime somebody isn't speaking, people are questioning why. Um, and yeah. unless you come out and you make a statement, people are going to assume whatever they want to assume. Usually the worst. Um, so, yeah. I like again, in the aftermath of this, I imagine both families were getting, like just from my short time on the internet seeing the kind of shit i get i can't imagine what right these families would have gotten in the mail shit left at their house because they were in this town right like mm -hmm. they were they in have to this go to the town. grocery store uh, they were also like, <sighs> they were very much uh scapegoats in this as well like it did become a yeah, let's blame course. the parents thing um which yeah is also understandable. Um, they were they were sued. Um, I think one of the families tried to bring a lawsuit of like three million dollars or something. Um, there was like one settlement that was made um, as a result of the lawsuits. I think for a few hundred thousand dollars per family, um, and the Klebolds have um, settled additional lawsuits outside of court for undisclosed undisclosed sums. Um, which is all again like very understandable like i'm not mad no. at the victims families for like suing these two families um but it's not always as simple um as like let's blame the parenting parents doesn't um, control everything like yeah if parents could control who their kids were there wouldn't be children being sent to like fucking conversion right. therapy like <laughs> not to compare like gays yeah. to killers but like you people rebel against their parents you could have the nicest sweetest most like peaceful parents in the world and then your way of rebelling is to be the opposite like i can get right i get every side of of the parent angle yeah yeah 
And what like again, Sue Klebold's like big thing is like mental health because like one of the things that she I guess discovered like when they gave her his journals was like that he was mm-hmm. profoundly depressed. Um, and she she bears the guilt for that because she's like, if I had known, I would have gotten him into therapy. And sh- her assumption is that he was profoundly depressed in a way that like kind of metastasized Mm -hmm. into like a bitter resentment and he took it out on other people um so like her thing is like about um (sighs) mental health and openness and like parents um taking an active role in their children's mental health um because she didn't know and and i'm i i i'm sure she was right i'm sure like most teenagers are uh profoundly depressed like i said yeah. cassie bernal had had very similar writings to both eric and um and dylan um but she had yeah. an yeah. intervention in the form of this like christian camp um so like if if again like it, this is why it's so absurd to say that like dave cullen's uh theory that like eric would have gone on to do something else like if there had been right. interventions yeah. Maybe he wouldn't. Teens are teens are fucking crazy. They're like, every last one of them. Every like, last one of them. <laughs> You're full of so many hormones. So now I want to talk about like the changes in schools. Uh in the immediate aftermath of Columbine, um, a lot of the anger that wasn't addressed at the media or addressed at the uh parents was addressed at the police and SWAT response to the massacre. So in their defense, and I hope that this is the only time that you ever hear me defend cops on this podcast, uh, (laughs) we had never experienced anything like Columbine before. Like I said before, like SWAT teams had assembled outside of the building, like it was a hostage crisis and we're waiting for demands, but the killers had no demands. They just wanted like, attention and pain the killing was over in a little over 45 minutes but it was hours before anyone would enter the building um and like i said in the first episode dave sanders probably would have lived if he hadn't been left to bleed out for three hours yeah uh he like he had been shot literally minutes before the killers killed themselves Uh, so Columbine is why we have a different response tactic to active shooters nowadays. Like this, um, our active shooter drills and our active shooter protocol for law enforcement, um, was changed as a, a direct response to the inaction of SWAT and law enforcement Mm -hmm. at Columbine. Uh, the goal right now for law enforcement is to run in right away, neutralize the shooter right away, and don't wait for questions or demands. And for students, it's like duck and cover. It's it's like we're living yeah. in the Cold War again. Do they, what do they say to do if like somebody, because I've never been in one of these drills. Is there any situations where they instruct the children to like, mm-hmm attack uh get low um find uh find cover uh lights out uh because you want to be uh like as not visible as possible but like if they're in the room like not like no the, no the, get, they don't get low and get cover that. like that's it the best you can do so if they're in the room that's sort there of there are like... companies that sell bulletproof backpacks that you can try to use to cover yourself mm, i've oh mm-hmm. yeah i've seen this um a lot of schools mm-hmm. uh, post Columbine, uh, and I'm sure I have this in my notes somewhere. I'm jumping around. This is a fast and dirty episode. Um, but a lot of schools uh, since have, I, I don't think anybody ever did it like permanently, but like some schools would require for like periods of time that people like bring in see through backpacks. Um, yeah. S- oh. Schools would have like, um, I, I know that Columbine. Um, for the longest time afterwards, uh, locked all of their entrances except for one. So every kid would have to go in and out of the same door to get in and out of school. Um, so obviously that causes lines of people trying to get yeah. in. 
That's also like very scary to me. They have to unlock those at a certain point though, right? Because if not, then you have a fire hazard. hazard. Yeah. Yeah. Also a shooting hazard. And a shooting hazard. Somebody can come in through a fucking window. Yeah. Because you can be able to escape. My school definitely locked a lot of entrances. My school was also like gated from the outside so that nobody could get in during school hour. Like if you were late. Really? You had to you had to come in through the office. Oh, okay, that's intense. They would definitely lock entrances, but mm-hmm. I think they were only locked from the outside. Not the inside. Um to prevent people not necessarily from like any sort of violence, but just right. to prevent people from like coming and going as they pleased. Um because like grade nines are like 14 years old and should not be (laughs) walking out of school in the middle of the day so now now that i that i have gotten given some cops the benefit of the doubt a little bit uh one thing i can tell you about is the cover-up oh so do you remember brooks brown the kid that eric was like i like you now get out of here too yes okay well he and Eric were on again, off again friends. Uh, and when they had their fallings out, Eric would call his house and say he was going to kill him and was like constantly um. harassing him and like <laughs> left a pipe bomb outside of his house one time. Okay, that is not cool, you guys. And really? And Brooke's parents reported wow. Eric to the police. <gasps> Over a dozen times, and they <gasps> neglected to investigate. Whoa. Yes, yes. In the like, in the like year, t- maybe two years leading up to the killing, they were constantly calling the police, and they were like, "You need to check bomb. on this kid. He's he's acting crazy. He's acting erratic. He's like threatening my child. He's calling us in the middle of the night." Um, and that kid didn't die. No, Brooks did not die. It's very, it's very, sorry, it's just very interesting to me that for like a year, he was, he was, he was getting and, death he was threats like, and pipe bombs, but they were on again around this time. Yes, they had made okay. up, they had made up, they were, fr- and he was like, I like you now, get out of here, Um, which, ag- like, he sounds so erratic, he sounds like... I, it, it, for me, this doesn't sound like a psychopath who's like, I'll kill anyone. Like, this sounds like an erratic, very troubled, yeah. disturbed teen yeah. who should have been picked up by the police and should have, like, there should have been an intervention. Yeah. Like, so much therapy. Yes. So after after the the killing, Brooks, Brooks's mom, Judy, even stated that she called the cops after she saw the killers trying to purchase guns before the shooting and oh. no one returned her call. Like, they, Oh my God. So this might've been before they got the older girl to do it for them. They might've tried mm-hmm. to do it at the store. Um, this is just something that she said. Like, I don't know if there's any other proof. Right. It's just a witness statement, but she was like, yeah, I saw them at the Walmart or whatever, like trying to buy guns and they got turned away. And no one returned her call. We need to increase the police funding. <laughs> Clearly. So, that, <laughs> so that, that they have the funding to return people's calls. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Those collect calls really add up. <laughs> <laughs> From that one woman. <laughs> they were like looking at the, the phone like, oh, it's her again. She's going to want us to do stuff. <laughs> we already did stuff last year. <laughs> On April 30th, 1999, 10 days after the massacre, high-ranking members of Jefferson County and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office met to decide whether they should reveal that investigator Michael Guerra (sighs) knew of a website Eric had made uh, (laughs) that made several violent threats two years before the Columbine shootings occurred. I'm going to kill everyone at columbinehighschool.com. Why didn't y'all look Mm -hmm. at his GeoCities page? Jesus Christ. I fucking hate them. (laughs) (laughs) No, not with the little mouse trail. Oh my gosh. (laughs) There's so many GeoCities pages about these killings because it was 1999. They're (laughs) so aesthetically pleasing. Oh, I bet. So... These uh, members of uh, Jefferson County and Jefferson County Sheriff's Office uh, 
decided to keep the information confidential and said nothing about it at the press conference that they held on April 30th, nor did they make it public in any other way at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, there's this like concept um, called the Columbine effect and it, it kind of encapsulates everything that we're talking about in this episode. It is the legacy of Columbine. It is uh, the way uh, schools have changed the way that they operate. It's the way law enforcement changed the, th the way that they operate. Uh, it's the myths. It's uh, the copycat crimes. Um, so uh, like I said, in the two decades since, uh, the way we went to school has changed. Um, it like schools were the one place that we thought kids would be safe. Um, and now we're seeing this um, process that kind of like s has snowballed um, as uh, as Columbine has inspired additional killings, uh, where schools are like becoming increasingly militarized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not really stopping these mass shootings. Uh, because like the militarization of schools and the uh, the increased like police presence mm -hmm. in schools usually doesn't target kids like Eric and Dylan. Nope. nope. It's the dark skinned kids, it's the black kids, it's mm -hmm. the marginalized kids, the kids that, yeah. you know, are neurodivergent and they may act a little weird. So then they get become more scrutinized. Yep. Mm hmm. And that was certainly my experience with um, the school resource officers. I love that cute little euphemism. Cops. In my school, is like they were always like getting into fights or like shouting abuse at like black kids. Always. Yeah. And like my school, I, I grew up in central Maine. So like my school was like 99.9% .9 white. Um, and I personally never saw much with our, our resource officer. I, I don't remember ever seeing him do much. Like the most exciting day I remember for him was the day there was a moose on campus. That rocks. Which is the most main thing that's <laughs> probably ever happened to me. No, you're reading this man there was to a, There was fill. a moose. You're like, the be that was the <laughs> best day of his fucking life. And it's been all downhill <laughs> since then. Because he got to run around the hallways and be like, okay, go into your classrooms and don't get, don't leave. It became this really What does he think it's going to barrel in? I guess so. They were like all weird. Like at one point, some of the students thought um, there was a rumor that the moose had somehow managed to get into the building because they were acting so freaked out about it. But no, it was just outside. It was in the it was in the football field at one point, and then I think later it was in the the soccer field. And it was a female; it wasn't a male, so it didn't mm -hmm. have the antlers. But like Ew. it was just like around, and they were freaking out Ew. about it. They were worried that like a student was going to go outside and get trampled. I guess. Which, in fairness, I am afraid of moose because they are terrifying. But like, it was outside. We were fine. That's Ew, they look without antlers. They look so fucking. St I just googled lady moose. <laughs> so bald. <laughs> <laughs> lady moose. Lady moose. What the fuck yeah. is wrong with it? They are huge. Like, no, even I know. The they're like are still. They're huge like seven though, times like... the size of a car. <laughs> if you, yeah, like, especially like, like the Canadian ones, which I think are probably the same as the main ones, right? Yeah, I think so. I think it's the same species, generally. <laughs> um, my like my school resource officer. One thing I do remember from school is just like constantly being in school lockdowns for drug busts. Oh. Like they'd constantly. Oh really. Yeah, they would constantly like make an announcement that we had to stay in the classrooms because they were going to check all of our lockers and come through all the mm -hmm. halls all the time. It was so disruptive. And it's like, just let these stupid children have their crappy little CD, CD STEMI I know, right? Like, right. <laughs> they were terrified of drugs. So as i've referenced several times and is is kind of like undeniable when talking about columbine the columbine killers have attracted fans and copycats um immediately after the attack uh and in part this is due to some of the myths that came out of the massacre like disaffected young men saw themselves in the bullied virgins that the media portrayed eric and dylan to be the first copycat attack came only eight days after Columbine. Jesus, I didn't realize it was so soon mm -hmm. after. 
I'm not going to like sit here and list <laughs> all of the attacks that were inspired by Columbine um, because we would be here all day and it would be depressing. And um, like, there's no way you'd be able to retain any of that yeah, information. I, I don't think that's good radio. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's not almost without fit. Like this is um, eight days is, is bonkers. That is like the yeah, the this case has had like this this tragic event has had such an impact on the young men who would go on to do their own forms of mass violence um that like investigators who worked on the case were just like constantly getting called up and asked about columbine um without fail like most of the mass shooters who've committed the the biggest um mass shootings in the last 20 years uh when investigators looking into their cases for possible motives have like searched their houses they found like shrines to eric and dylan they've found manifestos talking about wanting to beat their kill count um like they this is not like a theory based on aesthetics this is very much um something that is stated very explicit Mm mm-hmm And in the era of social media, Tumblr blogs have surfaced portraying the killers as teen heartthrobs. I hate it. I hate it. They do this with serial killers, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, not you're writing slash fic about, like, two real-life murderers, you sick fucks. Literally. They call themselves Columbiners, and, you know, there's... It's not even... (sighs) It's not even good. Um, <laughs> there, it's either like yeah, self insert fanfic where one of them is your boyfriend, or there's a lot of, of fanfic where they're gay lovers. I I knew that that would be mm-hmm. what it was. Yeah, Tumblr is a disease. It's the same shit they write about Hamilton, uh, Bill, Billy, and Stu, or mm. whatever the fuck. Um, from scream that's right Right. except they don't exist like feel free they're not real (laughs) feel free and also that's kind of in the text (laughs) yeah they're all over each other in that last scene (laughs) oh 100 like honestly they are my favorite gay couple Mm -hmm. ever portrayed in cinema um and that's okay to have these little head cannons about characters yeah, fictional people who don't exist real people who should not even be like spoken about as <laughs> in this way where you're like idolizing them yeah. that's that's so fucking who nasty. killed actual people yeah. whose families are still alive like it's different like from like when we're like when we're screeching and howling over fucking those two female pirates who killed people like none of their relatives are still alive no no like and that's one of the reasons we like i feel more comfortable like talking about these situations is number one they're bad people number two we're not glorifying them but if we are like joking about how like kind of base that Mm -hmm. you half you beat a rapist half to death or whatever this is also like hundreds of years Mm -hmm. ago and everyone involved is dead like so, Kaylin, you remember how you were like, oh, I can't imagine the kind of letters no. that these families were getting, like the families of the killers were getting? Yes. Well, Sue Klebold still sometimes receives letters from her son's fans Ugh. expressing how they wish they could have his babies. God, that must must be worse to a certain degree, right? Like getting those kind of letters? Like leave this woman alone. Like, yes. I, I, like the most disturbing ugh, no. thing. No. No, 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 I no. want to have your son's babies. You Eject. I hate it. I hate it. I... Okay. Therapy. F- to start. To start. Let's start mm-hmm. let's at start. therapy. And then maybe yeah. somebody slaps you. Like, tw- like at least really twice hard in the face. <laughs> like, every single time you go to write a letter to, like, a dead person's parent, 
saying you want to have their child's babies like maybe somebody just comes up and just like slaps you really hard in the back of the head and it's like no maybe with like a rolled up newspaper Mm -hmm. or something and they spray a little water on your face (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) spray you with a water bottle because like like i do not support (laughs) violence but like these people they need reality Mm -hmm. to be like force fed to them yeah because like that's sick like restraining order like yeah 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 yeah. restraining order keep your sick little shit on tumblr you fucking freak leave that poor woman alone like jesus leave her alone oh my god (sighs) so yeah, a number of the suspects who have carried out planned school shoot or or planned school shootings uh, not only like wear the same clothing, read the same mm. books, and adopt the same tactics as the gunmen, uh, some of them have also even contacted the victims of previous shootings before they attempt their own attacks. Ugh, ew. So they'll like reach out to Columbine survivors or like Aurora survivors and like try to talk to them, and then they'll go create some more okay, so you know victims. the school shooter turned tiktok influencer that i recently did a video on yes mm-hmm. apparently it's come out that he has went and followed uh survivors of school <gasps> shootings oh no and like dm'd them to like try and become friends with them oh no that is so common no. that's common of all these like school shooters as they yeah. become obsessed mm-hmm. he also watched Bowling for Columbine while writing his suicide note. That's so funny. Have you guys seen Bowling for Columbine? I have. It's been a really long time. Bowling for Columbine was my introduction to Columbine. Bowling for Columbine fucking rocks, first of all. Very little of it is actually about Columbine. It's about American gun culture. Right. Gun culture, yeah. um, So that's just like a very strange documentary for him to put on. I guess that, like there wasn't much else available at the time. <laughs> like, it has Columbine in the title. <laughs> this was in like two thousand and like four or something. So like that was a while ago. That was not too long after. Yeah, after right. I mean, so, there like, there was a lot yeah. of stuff they could have. I guess not a lot of full documentaries, but like a lot of sixty mm-hmm. minutes style shit. Reporting on this was breathless. Like it was, yeah. I think it, the Columbine had like a front page story on the New York Times um, for something crazy, like 17 weeks following Columbine. Like it was all anybody wanted to talk about because um, it was, we'd never had anything like this happen before. Right. Yeah. So I argue, I posit that the subsequent victims of attacks um, based on the attacks of the Columbine killers can be added to the initial death toll of 15. Um, I think there's an argument that like you can say that like Uvalde and that Virginia Tech and that uh, Aurora, that all those deaths are blood on the Columbine killer's hands. Um so too can the deaths of Greg Barnes, who'd been a sophomore during the attack, and Carla Hawkhalter, the mother of a student who'd been wounded at Columbine, both of whom died by suicide following the attack. Greg Bar- Barnes was still, uh, still in school. I think, I think he died like a year or two after, um, but just couldn't, couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle the PTSD and died by suicide uh carla hawk halter i think i talked about in the last episode her mother yeah the mother um and so many people were like permanently disabled mm -hmm. like shot in the spine unable to walk like or depressed um and austin eubanks um struggled with addiction with heroin addiction following the massacre um, and he recovered and uh, became like a motivational speaker um, at like age 29. The only good motivational yeah. speaker. Um, and it it was literally like he developed, uh, you know, PTSD and dealt with it with a drug addiction. And mm-hmm. uh, but then he relapsed after the 2018 Parkland shooting and he died of a heroin overdose in 2019. Oh, yeah. Fuck. That's horrible. According to the people that knew him 
Parkland in particular hit him really hard. I think Parkland hit a lot of us really hard because that was the one where it almost felt like something was going to change. Yeah. Like those kids were, yeah, they weren't just grieving. They were angry. Yeah. And it almost felt like there was a sea change and then that didn't happen. Um, and I think that that and, and Newtown, the one where it was a bunch of babies, the first one where it was a bunch of babies, um, where we thought, well, yeah. something's going to happen now because we, cause these are, aren't teenagers. Like yeah. these are little kids. Um, and, and I think that was like, that was definitely my black pill moment. <laughs> But I think 2018 hit a lot of people. Parkland really hit a lot of people hard because it, again, felt like there something was going to happen and it didn't. Yeah. These deaths are all part of the mass shooting ripple effect. Um, these these people who die by suicide, these people who succumb to deaths of despair, um, but whose names are not mentioned in the final victim counts. I consider them to be victims of the Columbine tragedy. Um, because they are, because they would still be with us if Columbine had never happened. Yeah. The Columbine killers set out to beat Timothy McVeigh's kill count. In a sense, they failed, but in another sense, they succeeded in many ways they could have never imagined. The basic story of Columbine is so well known that it almost doesn't need repeating. Two middle-class American white boys, easy access to guns, and a bunch of dead kids. Throughout this episode, I've done my best to debunk some of the myths that have attached themselves to the narrative around Columbine, but I think it's important to acknowledge how these myths have become so sticky that in some ways they've become more important parts of the Columbine story than the actual facts of the case. They've become its legacy, and I almost don't think it matters that they aren't true, only that people believe them. You've been listening to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. There are a couple ways to support us. Patreon supporters get bonuses like extended episodes with audio from the cutting room floor and adding cadavers to our suggestion cemetery. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and we might read it out on the show. Follow Respect the Dead on all platforms at underscore respect the dead. Thanks so much for listening. See you next Monday for another worm feast. I'm Kaylin Conrad. I'm Ailey Mandy. And I'm Hoots. Bye. Bye.